It's all laid out as if you're going to do it. And this is like practical stuff, right? So when should you be thinking about this? So this happens, first of all, once you've defined your population. And this is so important. I'm gonna call on you in a minute, Anisha, to share what you were thinking about yesterday. So what are the criteria for someone to be included in your study? Are there age boundaries? Like, are you just leaving it wide open for age? Do you want to include 16-year-olds and 85-year-olds? Or should it be narrower for some reason? Are there gender stipulations? Do you want to focus on males or females for some reason? Do you think that they're going to be different? Are you going to focus on both and compare them? Are you focusing, in particular here, are you focusing on novel people? Or is that you're just interested in people in general? It doesn't have to be novel. Or other, like Chess is doing this um, research. She wants to do a study on um, an aspect of addiction. So she's going to be looking at people who have struggled with addiction. Um, Leah is looking at the Kinalda ceremony, and she is looking for women of a certain age. She's going to choose, I think, 10 years after the ceremony. So like women age 20 to 25, something like that, um, who are Navajo. And then she's going to compare those who have gone through the ceremony with those who haven't. What are your criteria for inclusion? Again, Arnitha, can you share any of what you were thinking about last class? Okay, but then I thought you had said they could be any age. They didn't have to be students. Am I, am I, I might have misremembered. No, they're college students. Okay, college students. Yeah. And what other criteria? So am I counted in there? Are you a college student? If I was taking a class, I would be. I'm, I'm going to take classes. Wow. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I would think so. Well, I, I guess why not? And what other criteria are there? Well, if you think it's going to affect the outcome, it's not mean. It's not saying, oh, you're not included. It's just like it's a different population. That's all. Yeah. So. But I thought you had said at one point that some people even paint with their hands, their, their feet. Their toes, yeah. So maybe you'll think about whether that matters. Maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. I think it does. <laughs> and um, did you say they had to be painters? Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're like professional. They have to have the experience. They have to have experience painting. And are you going to stipulate how much experience? Maybe. No. Okay, I thought you were going to have like six months. So that would mean that your population, um, um, I'll just start A. That one was uh, people with hearing disabilities. All right, college um, students. Let's write that as an exclusion factor. College students with painting, um, we should say painting on canvas, like what if they paint Easter egg, you know, like <laughs> fingernails. <laughs> yeah, painting on canvas. With painting, all right, with, all right, let's redo. Are you still with us, Titania? Yes, I'm still here. All right, we'll ask you this in a minute because this is so important. Well, my eraser isn't working. So with experience, painting, on canvas, and I would say more than six months experience painting on canvas. All right, 
And that's that. Okay. That's her, those are her inclusion. She might think of more. Okay. And then for her, exclusion, there are some reasons we exclude people from the study. So if participating could harm the individuals, for example, you're studying um, breakups. Do you want people who are depressed to participate in this or could it be harmful for me to conduct a study on breakups and ask someone who's already depressed to participate in it? It might worsen their depression, right? It might harm them. So we have to think about that. So I might exclude people with depression from the study for that reason. Or maybe participating would provide irrelevant, not irrelevant, I'd say inaccurate information. Like if there's someone who is a non-reader and the task I'm asking them to do involves reading, I can't have them in the study because they're a non-reader, you see. Or the individual belongs to a different population such as if your population is painters and someone who only paints walls steps up. Okay. And so in Arnisha's case, an exclusion that she thought would be necessary for the second bullet point was to exclude people with hearing impairments because they can't listen to the music. They can't. What about someone who's like colorblind? Well, could they still be art an artist? Yeah. And then you probably, you have to think if you have a reason to exclude them, you know, if they could still do art, then, you know, you should have good reason. All right, let's take a moment here to talk about Cody's study and what is your population of interest? So I'm just going to write, I'm just going to jot notes down here for each of you. My population? Mm -hmm. I would say like the majority of the population would probably be Palestinian, both male and female. Okay. As in comparison between both. Male and female college students. Is there any sort of experience they need to have all had? Mm, basically, like sophomore students and higher. Okay. So excluding freshmen, so it's really exciting. All right. I thought you were doing peer mentoring. Yeah. Would they have needed to have a mentor? Mm, yeah, the freshman. Or. I mean, in order to report on their experience from the mentoring, would they needed to have at some point had a mentor? Because not all students have a mentor. To like, go into a peer mentor program? Or no, to do your study. You're studying the impact of peer mentoring, I thought. Oh, no, no, no. I'm mine would be. Um, Listen. Actually, that does sound better. No, I, I like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to do the listening. I forgot. Yeah, the listening. yeah. No, that sounded really good. So you were going to maybe randomly assign them to. I liked that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So any college students will do, but you wanted to eliminate freshmen. And you yeah. have a good reason for that. Ah, oh, now I got the treatment put in my head, so I'm like, what if I could do that? <laughs> Maybe just sophomores and juniors who are in the middle might be a good idea. Yeah, but sophomore. you should think about why you're eliminating freshmen. Can you just summarize what you're doing for Titania's sake? Because she hasn't maybe heard. Oh, yeah. So I was going to do the... Um, so similar to how she was doing the music and how it affects the person's mood and emotions so like if listening to another person express what they feel or express the things they've gone through to see if it actually is effective in helping them cope or overcome okay yeah and so if i'm hearing you the dependent variable the thing you're going to measure is some sort of coping right mm -hmm. and your independent variable they're going to be these sophomores and juniors who are, that's a good year to work with because, you know, your freshmen, they're kind of vulnerable. Yeah. You don't want to put them in an experiment like that. 
But once they're sophomores or juniors, they're kind of settled in and you're gonna randomly assign them. So do, they, so do we maybe want people who feel like they're struggling with something, like a problem of some sort? Because why else would they be coming to the mentor? Yeah, most of them come because they're, they're lost. Like they don't know, not so much lost, lost, but like, you know, it was just lost of resources. Okay. Yeah. So they're struggling with something. Yeah. So you'd have to think about how to recruit them. And that's good. I like that. And then they're going to be randomly assigned to a mentor who does, say, 70% listening mm -hmm. versus talking and then maybe flip it in the other condition? Yeah, I think that's good. Maybe, okay. And we'll think about that. But it maybe would be um, listening, um, and it's versus talking. So it would be like the therapeutic approach, the mentoring approach. Mm -hmm. What we would do to protect the um, people who actually really do are really seeking help. If they wanted to participate in the study, we'd give them some sort of a reward, but because you have the hypothesis with good reason that listening will be more beneficial, they would each, you do a, well, it's called a counterbalance design. Mm -hmm. So it means you take all of these students who need help and you'd assign them to two sessions. And in the first session, you would, for half the group, do more talking and for the other half, do more listening. And then the second session, you'd flip it, but we compare and we get a response after each session. So that's kind of the way you would approach that so that you're not like you're actually getting the help they need. Okay. So this is the kind of thing you'll be thinking about. And Titania, remind us of what you're gonna be studying so we can think about your population too. You're muted. Titania, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to talk to myself over stuff. here. You could tell. <laughs> um, I, mine's, my research topic was about, I guess, special needs children kind of in that population. And I was kind of thinking about the grades from second to four. Children, all right, so second and fourth grade children. Okay, who have special needs, any type of disability in particular? Um, who are labeled? Just, just enough to qualify them to have um, special need help. So with mild disabilities, does it matter if the disability is like a learning disability or a, say, an emotional disability? Um, no, I, I don't, I don't wouldn't think so. Yeah, because um, I'm kind of stuck on two topics about how to do the research. Okay. And one of it. Variable? What are you measuring? Oh, I wanted to measure their, I guess, learning how well they can learn in the environment that they are placed in. Okay, the inclusion idea. Yeah. And how are, how do you, what kind of learning, in what subject area? Are you gonna give them a test or how are you thinking to measure that? I'm guessing um, the, the material that's provided based on, from their teacher, if they're able to like finish the work or do the work without any um, problems. Okay, if they can do the work independently. Yeah, independently. So that's one variable then is independent work task completion. Yes. Okay, so we'll think more about how you're gonna measure these variables and you should be getting ideas from the research studies we're already reading. That's my hope. So, are there any other things that we can help you think about here before we go on to the next part of this content? Mm, not sure. <laughs> okay, that's okay, we can do that. All right, so let's go on. The second thing is you need to figure out how many participants you actually need. So if you have too many participants, then 
it reduces what's called the power of your statistics. And it means you might get a significant result that it, is, it doesn't make any difference. It's significant statistically, but it doesn't make any real life difference. And having too few participants mean that your statistics probably aren't gonna get you a significant result, even if you're right. And so how do you figure out how many people you need? So if you have descriptive research, you're just getting information like sending out a survey. Then you can use tools like this. Like a statistical calculator and it'll tell you just how many you need. So you would enter some parameters right here. So you'd have to know how many are in the population. We already talked about that. How confident you want to be and what your margin of error is. And you can leave all these settings alone because they're all good. That's why we have statistics first because you'll know what these things mean. That's why it's a prereq, but I don't think anyone in here has had stats. But, and then if whatever the population is. So for you, Titania, it would be how many children are you interested only in the Navajo Nation? Who are you interested in representing? Sorry, forgot. Um, the Navajo Nation. Just in the Navajo Nation. All right. Yes, and just so in the Navajo Nation. Maybe you know how many people are in that, but maybe you can get a list of all these children with mild disabilities. And mm -hmm. if you could get such a list, then you could do a beautiful random sampling of those children. And let's say you found out that there were, um, I don't know how many, 1,000 of those children. Then you just click enter it, and it'll tell you that you need 278 children. That's for a survey type thing for descriptive research. Um, but if you're doing inferential research like you are, um, Anisha, then you need to actually do what's called a power analysis and figure out how many individuals you need. And so I'll help you with that once your whole study is designed, you'll figure out how many you need by analyzing the power. And there's other kinds of calculators for correlational research, if that's what you're doing. And so there are tools that will calculate this for us. And I see I didn't bring up the power analysis one. So that's something you'll need to do. And so where do you get your sample? So that's gonna depend on your population. So if you have a finite list, like you actually, let's say Titania could get the list of all those individuals who are in grades two through four identified with a mild disability. Let's say that list existed and the school district found your work important enough that they allowed you to access it and select a sample from it. Then you would be able to um, draw from that list. And we looked already at random sampling from that. But if your population is more narrow, like I think that uh, Chas is interested in Navajo people struggling with addiction or something like that, or alcohol addiction, then you can't, you might not be able to really use random sampling. But what could you do? In this case, you could use snowball sampling, which we talked about in our last class. And so you'd start with someone you know who struggles with addiction, and they would refer you to other people who would refer you to other people and other people till you get enough participants. It is non-random, so it's a limitation of your study. You could use voluntary request sampling method, also non-random. Go to an addiction clinic and ask the administrator if they circulate a flyer to seek participants. Speak at local chapter houses to request volunteers. Circulate a request for volunteers by a large email list group. And the problem is that old favorite non-response bias, the idea that those who decline to participate systematically differ from those who participate. And so you would have to write about that in the limitation section of your paper. But that's a limitation of your study. If your populations are more general, like if you're not intending to generalize only to Navajo people, then one way to get just random people who might be Navajo but might not be is universities have these big pools. Everyone who takes intro to psych often 
they have to agree to they they don't have to they have an alternative but they generally want to participate in studies and so they provide certain data of interest for screening and then um, you could possibly access that pool if you knew a collaborator there like you might ask me and I have collaborators at a couple different universities and maybe I could get you a sample. Amazon MTurk and services like these. So there are actually people who are hired. It's like their job, you know, they're at home, but they get hired and paid to take surveys. And they get paid a certain amount for each survey or study they participate in. And um, it's done to be kind of good. I've used Amazon MTurk for my own work and you get a pretty decent representative pool more diverse than college students who at those big universities tend to be, you know, in their around 20 years of age. And you get results very quickly, um, within hours sometimes. Um, they can add up in cost if you're seeking a large number of participants. And there are some other possible challenges. And then how are you gonna get people to help you out? How are you going to get your students or Nisha to participate in your study? Um, advertise. You know, advertise, but why would they want to use their time? And a lot of times we compensate our participants. We give them something. Food. Yeah, food, food is a good example. Um, so it could, I didn't even put it on here. <laughs> gift cards. Yeah, you, you get pizza, you know, or something like that. But gift cards. If it's in a school situation, extra credit. If the professor is supporting the work, we'll talk about this more at our ethics because there are risks to that. Lottery drawings, you know, if you participate, we're going to put your name in the hat and you will win a new car. Material goods like travel mugs or special pens, food, and even write food. Let's mm -hmm. write it here. It's very important. Food. <laughs> extra credit. I said that twice. Um, access to the professional version of the app. If you participate in our study, you'll have free access to YouTube, YouTube Pro for, you know, whatever. Those are the kinds of compensation. But we have to be super careful because ethical laws say we can't offer compensation that's so great that someone is coerced into participating when they otherwise might not. And we'll look at that next week, this coercion idea. And for example, Imagine if there's a homeless person in Tucson, there are a lot of people who struggle with homelessness and pr probably here too. And um, let's say you were a doctor and you wanted to do some medical testing that could cause them harm. But you go up to them and you say, hey, I'll give you, um, you know, $300 if you participate in the study. And to someone who's homeless and hungry, the $300 might be worth more than their health. Like they might be more concerned with getting food right now in a shelter than they would be about worried about what's going to happen in this study. So that's called coercion. You're giving them something that's worth so much to them or a student who's about to flunk out of college. And all of a sudden, along comes this opportunity to earn extra credit and all they have to do is participate in a study, you know, mm -mm. you can't do that. So we'll talk about ways to avoid those sorts of coercive techniques next class session. So next we come to recruitment. How are you going to? You already said a flyer, right, Arnisha? Mm -hmm. so. One thing people do on college campuses is ask professors that you know whether you could recruit from their class. Could you come and talk to their class and ask people to participate? And you might even say to that professor, would you be willing to offer extra credit if they participated? And as a professor, I'd have to say, I'd have to think about it because I'd have to, I don't wanna coerce anybody. And if a student really needs extra credit, they might participate even when it's not in their best interest if they need the extra credit. So that would be another form of coercion. Probably I would say yes, but what I'd have to do is offer, say to the students, you can earn this extra credit by participating in the study or in this other way. 
so that I, they don't feel coerced into participating. These are all ethical things. You could go to those <laughs> chapter meetings or other meetings of people who might meet your screening requirements. So Titania, you know, there might, what you really need is participation from parents because you can't do anything with children unless the parents consent to it. And so maybe there's a parent support group for children with mild disabilities and you go speak at that group. And that's where you get your participants. Maybe you'll just send an email survey when it goes non-random ways and hope people participate. That's probably the worst way to get a representative sample, but maybe you'll do stuff on social media. We missed our part on compensation, but we'll talk about it more because you'll be dealing with all that. Um, maybe you'll talk to administrators, like maybe um, Jess, looking at addiction, would be going to a local addiction treatment center and speaking to the administrator to see if they'd be willing to distribute the flyer to people who have struggled with addiction. That might be a way. But likewise, we have to handle it with care because we can't have any participants feeling unduly pressured to participate and that we have to avoid overtly pressuring people or even subtly, like through peer pressure, like all your friends are doing it. So you do it even though you don't really want to do it. So everything has to be taken to avoid that. And people in power positions may not recruit subordinates. So Anisha, you become so good at your research that a new student is hired and she's underneath you, you're teaching her, you're in a power position, you cannot recruit her to be in your study. <laughs> that sort of thing. And you always need to inform participants of their rights. So that's recruitment, we talked about compensation and screening is the, we're almost done. So screening is, okay, you have defined your population you know you want college students aged 18 to 45 who have six months experience with painting and you know are not hearing impaired. Well, how are you gonna get that? How are you gonna know that people meet your criteria? So in some way, you're going to need to screen your population. So when I worked with MTurk, I, I did gather data there for a couple of studies. And what I did is first the, the workers who are gonna get paid to take my survey, they would come into the site and click on it that they're interested and they would come right away to a screening tool. And the first question would be like, are you over 18? And if they click yes, they continue. And if they click no, they come to a thank you very much. We're sorry, but you're not eligible. And then what's my next screening question? You know, at one point I was looking at people who had within the last six months been in residential treatment for alcohol addiction. And so I had certain ways of screening to make sure that they met my criteria. And then if they pass all those criteria, then they would be moved on to be informed of their rights. And then they would participate in the study and then they would get paid. but you'll have to screen them in some way. So you have to think about this. And by the way, with your flyers, your recruitment, that is gonna be a part of your paper. You're gonna to have to design your recruitment materials. If it's a poster, you're gonna to have to have a recruitment plan and talk about a screening plan. So that's what I just wrote out here. And that's all, that's all I have here. So you're gonna be including your recruitment plan, including screening and your flyers or anything you're gonna use, or if you're writing an email, what is your email gonna say? You're gonna to have to have your informed consent documents and then all your survey tools too. So, are all your materials that you'll be using. So that's what I have for you today. So what questions do we have? On any of this important stuff? <laughs> 